we're joined by the one and only Joe Glenson. How are you doing, mate? Not bad, mate. Not bad. Joe or Joey? Joe. Because I've heard people say Joey. Joey. People do say that. I don't want to be like... You can, say, you can call me Joe if you want. I don't mind. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, and uh, for the audience out there, tell us a little bit about yourself. The last 10 years. The last 10 years, I am what uh, Wellington called the common scum of the earth. Um, the lowly soldier. Um, and so I joined the army in 2004 because I was broke, because I'm working class. And for lots of partially economic, partially the ideological stuff. Um, went to Afghanistan, quite quickly figured out it was bullshit. Came back from tour, refused to go back. Um, ended up um, AWOL for two and a half years in the grand tradition of Vietnam vets running off to Canada or Sweden. I ended up in Australia for a couple of years. Came back, politicised, became very publicly anti-war. Uh, got locked up for nine months in a military prison, which was all shits and giggles. What's that like, military? Is that worse than a cat B or a cat A? Is it it's, like a... it's, it's, it, uh, what's the low, I suppose it's technically a low security prison. Right. And in total, like, there were guys in there who had been in both and who were kind of connoisseurs of the, of the prison system. And some of them said it was better, some of them said it was worse. Obviously, <laughs> in the military prison, it's a military regime. So it's familiar, but, and you get... I know, it's, a, it's a weird one. Like they had different. I like in a in a civvy prison, you get locked up for there's more lock up or bang up or whatever they called it. Uh, and in the military prison, there's less of that, but you still get you get fucked around a lot more. And it's uh, you have to wear a uniform and iron your kit and do certain military things. Tougher people generally, right? I, I presume or not? W what type of people are in there? Yeah. Um, I mean, tougher people is the screws oh, yeah. and the prisoners, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, the screws were pretty unhappy about it. In fact, the screw like there's a military prison screws core. And it's all the people who don't want to go to Afghanistan. So they, they rebadged to this uh, military prison thing. They got promoted straight to sergeant and they never really went anywhere. So it's the guys who really didn't want to die. So they were kind of on side in a way. And they were the kind of guys who were getting towards the end of their careers. And they're like, I'm not going, I'm not running around in the sand pit anymore. I'm sick of it. Um, so and it's interesting. It's interesting. And so since then, what's happened? Um, I came out of jail, went to uni, did uh, international relations, wrote a book, published a book, buy it, Verso Books, um, Soldier Box. It's very good, I'm told. Um, and uh, then became a journalist. And uh, that's, that's where I am now. And um, so what's the, um, what's the organisation that you work with at the moment? Um, so I'm part of a group called Veterans for Peace, which is a, a UK chapter of an American organisation which came out of the um, anti-Vietnam War movement. These are, the, these are the actual uh, the guys of that era, these old Vietnam vets. They're amazing. They're, they're so, so cool. Uh, so uh, a friend of mine, Ben, um, who's an ex-SAS guy, founded a British chapter, and we're now 500 strong. Um, we, we're active around anti-war issues, anti-imperialist issues, um, and we're the biggest democratic veterans organisation uh, in the country. And we're part of this long history of angry soldiers and veterans in, in this country and around the world who do radical things and reject the, the narrative of empire and militarism and the army. So let's talk about this case that came up this week. So uh, five men were arrested, four of whom were serving soldiers, two have since been released, I should say, under a suspicion of terror-related offences. And it's being said that they're associated with a group called, is it National Action? That's right. National Action, who are a far-right organisation, white supremacist organisation. And when this happened... There were, you know, there was the kind of media blackout around it. It d didn't really seem like a massive story. I think that if they happened to have been Muslim soldiers, it would have been a much bigger story. And then there was the kind of um, social media storm, which, which is kind of inversely proportional to the amount of coverage often, um, saying, well, you know, these are white supremacist terrorists. Um, that, you know, this indicates that there is a endemic problem in, re in relation to racism, and far out ideology in the military, and this is kind of being sat on as an inconvenient truth. And as someone who, it, this might surprise you, but I've never been in the army. Really? I mean, I know I've got the not classic the, soldiers build. Not, yeah. even the, not even like the CCF, your local cadets or something. Yeah, it's cool. Listen, Everyone I smoked did that. a ton of weed at second. So did we in cadets. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I'm not, this is not happening. I did have um, some really good camo trackies though, but that was more of a, that was just a look to serve. Yeah. It was not what, a... What's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's at Joe J. Glenton. Can we just pull up Joe's, um, you, can we pull up Joe's <laughs> tweets and then, um, uh, because 
you had some very pertinent remarks in, in, in relation specifically to this, yeah. and we can track that in a second. Because I wanted to ask, so the way in which this is being framed is that this is indicative of an endemic problem in armed forces culture. Has that been your experience? Has that been something that you've observed? Um, it has. Uh, National Action or a neo not like a card-carrying mm -hmm. neo-Nazi group, I understand. You, I've, in my experience of being in the military and around the military, have occasionally come across neo-Nazis. Um, more often, it's um, different kinds of nationalists. So EDL, people who are enthused by the EDL or the BNP, and probably most commonly far-right kind of loyalist uh, guys from Northern Ireland and Scotland from that side of the orange side of the divide um, who are very um, open about their views. And there's space to do that. There's space to do that in the military because it, I mean, in a sense, I've come to the conclusion after years of kind of throwing this around my head, that in a way, the military is a far-right organisation. But most commonly, it's kind of more na less neo-Nazis, more kind of nationalist um, groups like the EDL, BNP. Um, and, and why is that? Um, I don't know. Maybe they're, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure why. Uh, I, guess, I guess it's just more accepted. Like, neo-Nazis probably would stand out more um, because they're so, so far right. Not to say the others are that much better. Um, but the nationalist stuff is kind of part of the part of the, the DNA of the military, there's, there's, it's kind of allowed to be there and it goes unremarked upon, it's just kind of accepted, um, though, those kind of ideas, there's just more, more tolerance for it and it's also kind of part, part of the, it's part of the training I suppose, the ideas of nation and nationhood um, in a, and, and I don't think neo-Nazism quite fits that um, in the same way. We're trawling over his, uh, Joey's tweets, but yeah. I think the specific ones. Really you, you had stuff. the back, back the McDonald's <laughs> workers one, right? so you can like... you know he's a good 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 person, uh, a good human being. Um, so you would say it's defined by a nationalism. So, but what I'm interested in is obviously because you've seen in the last ten years in particular mm -hmm. the rise of English nationalism, mm -hmm. the rise of the SNP, which for a unionist Scots a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing changes now in Ireland, the potential unification of Ireland. It's not probable, but it's on the agenda when it was just implausible before Brexit. Yeah. So are these broader political dynamics, uh, imperial decline, coupled with the potential breakdown of the Union, uh, a continued erosion fundamentally of a shared British identity, uh, declining prestige in the world and so on and so forth, are these coming together to, are they changing fundamentally those, those dynamics that have always been there of, of the army as a quintessentially nationalist organisation which inculcates far-right values. Sure. I think, I think when you look at the, the kind of juncture we're at, you have um, a couple of failed wars. We're a failed army. Our army's failed, not, for, not strictly because of the quality of the troops, but the quality of the leadership failed to, to, kept to achieve the aims of the wars. You also have um, a period of capitalist crisis. Um, and most guys who are coming out of the military, this is veterans more than mm -hmm. anything, are coming back to poverty and anger. A lot of these guys um, will come out with some degree of mental health issues. Uh, more, a, a more recently recognised, more in the States, the kind of signature injury of these wars is moral injury, when your morals are kind of fractured, your moral compass is fractured. And I think the conjunction of all those things probably has seen um, a rise, has made the military fertile ground and the veterans community fertile ground for nasty ideas. But at the same time, the other side of that is that some people go the other way and then you see the rise of things like Veterans for Peace, which has a much more progressive agenda. I mean, so I guess a question that I have is there seems to be two impulses um, in the left. And I think one is probably the tendency that I have, which is to address the military from a kind of instinctively anti-imperialist position, one which has looked at the war on terror rather than as failed wars, as kind of successful in the sense of, you know, um, s securing certain resources in terms of um, a never-ending war on terror, both domestically and abroad, which justifies ever more invasive forms of state power, again, both Would you say domestically Iraq, and... Afghan Afghan was successful? Well, the thing is, it's like, by what measure of success, right? Oil prices. You know what I mean? I don't think by any measure, really, that they're... No, I mean, I would, what I'm saying in that regard is that it's all, it becomes its own kind of raison d'etre, right? right? Like, you create an enemy, which you kind of, you know, there's a... Um, it's at the existential heart of what it means to exist in the global north at the moment, is mm. to simply not be of that barbarous eastern other. Right. Um, it's also an anniversary of 9-11 today and so we kind of think of that as this decisive historical break 
the thing about that analysis is that it rapidly becomes uh, unmoored from domestic politics. Mm -hmm. So we stop thinking about, well, how is it that the army becomes the only option to escape from certain neighbourhoods? Or why is it that that mode of belonging, which is certainly uh, predicated on forms of racialized and gendered violence, like why does that become so appealing? And then indeed, how do we engage with those who have come back um, incredibly damaged by those forms of violence? And then there's the other side of it, right, which is a kind of you know, patriotic protectionist leftism, mm -hmm. which says, well, socialism within this country and a strong military is a part of that and a kind of valorization and a lionization of military participation is a part of that. Um, how, how do we kind of create a conversation between these two things which are often pitted as polar opposites? And you've got a figure like Jeremy Corbyn, who is um, smack dab in the middle of this kind of mm -hmm. ideological contest. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, it's a very complex question. Um, yeah, sorry, it was a very rambly one. Very, no, 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 I mean, there, it's very valid, but um, it's called, I mean, how do you, uh, I'm going to try and boil it, like, how do you engage, there's two sides to it, how do you engage veterans? Um, I think you have to look at Corbyn's programme um, and compare it with the programme post-1945 mm -hmm. and go, look, this is the nearest thing that is being offered to you um, to that, to that original settlement, and, and they, a lot of veterans are still caught up with the idea of uh, lineage and history and the achievements of 1945. Um, so that's one part of it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, that's a big question. I, mean, I don't know if I can just roll out an answer. To be honest, because we just yeah. pulled up uh, Corbyn snubbing Glastonbury. Yeah, uh, and that was, of course, on the same day as Veterans Day. Yeah. Um, Which is a completely manufactured new thing that but they've it just got veterans. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it all is the, the Veterans what's Day the, particularly. They what's just come the, up with every what's days. the games that. The oh, the Invictus, Ga the yeah, Invictus is, Games. Yeah, where Harry, Harry, who there's a couple of people they've picked out as like the the veterans champions. Johnny Mercer is one mm -hmm. of them. Dan Jarvis is another one, and Harry is another Touring one. Labour MPs, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Harry is another one. And they, Harry went up on stage at the Invictus Games for wounded troops and shook hands with George fucking Bush. He was there, the the, the kind of architect of these guys' mutilation, or one of them. Um, and it, yeah, it's bizarre. It's absolutely bizarre. But then, there is this whole uh, this ch kind of charity sporting event racket which has grown up, and that's about bolstering support for the military. They, they talk about it as a kind of celebration of our guys. They always frame it as the blokes, mm. but the, and then they, they go and we, by which we mean the men and the women. It actually says that on the Help Hero site, like the blokes by which we mean yeah. the men and the women. Um, and it's it's really cynical, twisted. Have you seen the stuff. Millie, the Millies? Maybe we can oh, pull up. Sorry, this is a bit. God, they have like the best sniper award. And this all is this bad. Shit. Yeah, this is bad of me to the production team. But this, the Sun have this um, this Millies. They call it the military Oscars. Have you seen this? Mm -hmm. This is like the apotheosis of what's fucked up yeah, in Britain. The Sun, it's the Sun yeah. that runs it as well. I mean, it's interesting that you brought up um, the blokes, right? Because there was a report carried out in I think 2015. Um, which was addressing sexual harassment in the military. Oh, Jesus Christ almighty. Um, <laughs> it's bad, huh? Fuck but me. It found that four out of ten of female personnel in the army had received unwanted sexual comments or exposed to material of a sexual nature. 19% um, of women had received unwelcome sexual gestures. 36% had been sent sexually explicit material like pornography or whatever. And just 3% of um, unwanted sexual advances were ever reported. So we talk about the racialized aspect and I think that's incredibly important. But in terms of um, gender violence, both in terms of what happens when uh, military is posted abroad, but also internally as well, mm -hmm. is there a culture of what is often called toxic masculinity? Absolutely, that's absolutely the case. And I've only come to recognize that more recently. So I've, I, for years I was like, what is this tos toxic bit there? But uh, it's absolutely the case, um, and the army is riddled through it, with it. Well, like my corps, for example, part, uh, some parts of the military don't have women. Mm -hmm. Mine did, and they were routinely um, slurred and slandered and abused uh, in various ways. Um, and it's just absolutely standard practice, in my experience, um, across the military, and talking to women who've been in the military. That was there. And it's a weird thing that, that men who are in the military don't get, is that women appear when I've spoken to women veterans in the US and here, women in the military exist in a constant state of kind of sexual threat. They're constantly under, this is their words, not mine. They, they could explain it much more um, coherently, but there are, there's this constant, they know they're in a man's 
space, a hyper male space throughout the whole time. And that obviously is extremely damaging while they're in and afterwards. So when you were um, posted in Afghanistan, right, mm -hmm. how did people that you worked alongside make sense of the war that they were in? Uh, this is it, you, you don't because you're not, you're not, you're told not to. It's not your job, it's not, it's not in your pay scale. Um, you don't need to think about that, just crack on with the job in front of you. And so in that sense, it's kind of compartmentalised. It is not, I, as private scumbag Glenton, it's not my job. It's my job to worry about getting this load of ammunition from here to here. It's not my job to think about the geopolitics of Central Asia. Um, and that it's, and for a lot, most people that remains the case, um, where that's someone else's concern. And you just concentrate on your own little job uh, across the military. For some people that, and I suppose I'm one of them, that, cannot be sustained and I did start to question but then when you do you're in a, a world of fucking hurt to be honest because you can't go and debate these things and um, so even though there, it was obvious as the we were in the, there in the first stages of like the second Afghan war Helmand mm -hmm. and Kandahar even though it's very obvious that from within about two months that it was going very badly and no one really knew what we were doing and um, there was still no space to to question that because we talked about this um, before the show started, and I, I kind of think that would be a really valuable thing for our audience to hear about as well, is that you were talking to me about the difference between a professional army and a conscripted army, and mm -hmm. what that means in terms of people questioning the situations that they find themselves in, mm -hmm. and um, not complying. Yeah, yeah. Um, since Vietnam, and, and world, for, for us it's more World War I, because we never had a Vietnam, and uh, Vietnam for the Americans, um, the US and UK, for example, are terrified of, they cannot even countenance the idea of a conscript army because it is a virtual guarantee of some kind of rebellion on a large scale. And so we opt for professional armies, um, volunteers, um, generally on the, that, there's other kinds of conscription, obviously there's economic conscription, um, because um, they know the kind of radical potential that those big forced, big forced forms of military service hold. Um, and that's a terrifying thought for them. So is there potential to, this is very dangerous saying this as a Muslim, is there potential to radicalise people in UK armed forces, to politicise them and to, uh, you know, open up what can be, a, you know, we talked about the inability of the left to deal with soldiers, but mm -hmm. to open up a conversation? I think there is. I mean, the right are doing it, clearly. The right can do it, and I don't see why we can't. And there are... You know, the military is a weird thing because it is uh, very reactionary in many ways and very right wing and it's about power and submission. But at the same time, in a weird way, the military also has, it almost has the kind of germs of something else because there's a huge, in its own way, it relies on solidarity with each other. You still operate in a team, even if it's um, in, in a way that would be hard to kind of digest for the left. Uh, but also you look at the military and it's a planned economy. Everyone's fed and clothed and watered and educated to some extent and employed in what the establishment would suggest is a useful way. So there are germs of something else as well. And that kind of solidarity, which is very intense, and it obviously often in the military is described in a very masculine way, it's like the brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something of a value there, I think, but it depends which way it goes and if it could be expanded in a more progressive and meaningful way. I mean, people talk about this don't they, in terms of the selflessness that people, when they're fighting alongside one another in a high... Yeah, sort of high pressure situations. They're doing it for their their mates exactly. rather than a you know their comrades, queen and country. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you'd be, and you can see how so if you could uh, kind of create something like that on the left, um, it would uh, dis hopefully it could potentially dispense with some of the fracturing, the kind of fractious nature of the left. I just think there is some potential there, some kind of example, a deeply imperfect, flawed example, because obviously the, the military is very good at um, giving you kind of ingraining this team ethic and this solidarity in you and then they say now go and kick fucking Iraqi's doors in and so, so it's kind of they build this solidarity this human bond and it's a very human thing and then they use it for their own ends to dominate other countries uh, and abuse people and extract resources but there is something in there which I think is of value could be of value to us we're going to wrap up in a second oh I've got a question go on you ask a question and then I'll yeah, yeah. it's another biggie which is this is a point of antagonism in the left at the moment, and you've got those like Paul Mason who think that this isn't a useful conversation to have right now, so you kind of accept some of the limitations of you know, expansionist nationalism. But do you think that we can, and indeed should be working towards building a 
social majority, a cultural hegemony, whatever you want to call it, um, towards building a disarmed and demilitarized society. What are your strategies for that? Do you think it's possible? I think it is possible and I think we should attempt it. And one idea which is flowing around um, fellow dissenters, me and fellow dissenters, is the idea of neutrality, of Britain being neutral. And by that I do not mean defenceless, which is what the right would obviously respond, we're neutral, we're defenceless. But I do mean a non-expeditionary, a country which doesn't do expeditionary warfare in the way that it has. And that means not necessarily disbanding the army, uh, well not disbanding the army and not being defenceless. And in that, that might be a way that would appeal, because we talked about this earlier, there are large sections of the right who question and reject the arguments for us being in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and that also, the more traditional kind of anti-war left in the peace movement, that would probably also, also appeal to them. So maybe there's potential there. But this idea, and I'd encourage people to explore what neutrality, national neutrality actually means. Um, and look at that and see if there's some a kind of radical programme which can emerge from that that we can consider um, campaigning on. What do you yeah, think? I think, well, Paul, Paul Mason's sort of, his, when he stands for nuclear weapons, you know, he's a big fan of Trident. He says he is a fan of Trident because he wants to eliminate an expeditionary uh, army effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, well, look, we, uh, we want to save money, we want to put money elsewhere, we don't want to invade foreign countries, so keep Trident and get rid of the other bit. I can see the logic there. I don't know if I agree, but I can certainly see the logic there. And I, I think I, I would agree in terms of the, the neutrality thing, and you would maintain some kind of armed forces, clearly for defensive purposes. Um, in a context where Donald Trump has nuclear weapons, where Kim Jong-un has nuclear weapons... Uh, well, I think we will only see the further proliferation of nuclear weapons in the next several decades. I think unilateral disarmament maybe is a limited strategy. I believe, I mean, and this is a difficult thing to say because every schmuck in the Labour Party in progress well, I believe in multilateral disarmament, but it's a cover for not really believing mm. in disarmament whatsoever. But I think now, as more and more countries have access to these weapons and this technology and this knowledge, it, it, you know, we, we really have little other choice. We have to. And to underline the fact... I believe that. I would add, I, you know, I would say there's no other great miracle in the second half of the 20th century, as I said last week, actually, than the fact we didn't have a nuclear war after 1945. And it is a miracle. It's a fantastic thing. And unless we do something about it, I think it probably will happen at some point. And hundreds of millions of people will die. So I'm not saying it should be ignored, uh, but it would have to be addressed at the multilateral level. What Britain can do unilaterally, and this is perhaps where I agree a bit with Paul, is the expeditionary warfare stuff. I mean, I would, in fact, frame things in a slightly different way, but, and I think you see this in an especially pronounced way in, in America, where the technologies and tactics of the war on terror have been brought back domestically, in particular, to police black and Latino communities. And I think that there is a strong argument to be made in terms of the protection of civil liberties, and indeed in terms of domestic anti-racist movements, which haven't always lined up that productively with a kind of, you know, international anti-imperialism and making connections between these kinds of technologies of violence. And it's something that the Black Panthers did incredibly well. So going back to Vietnam is that it took the language of anti-imperialist opposition to warfare and connected it to issues like poor housing, like mass incarceration, like police violence. And I think that when you look at the political moment that we're in in the UK, where I think there's been this kind of wonderful confluence between Corbyn's Labour Party and, you know, politically engaged, in particular, young people of colour, young working class people of colour in urban centres, that's something that we can work on quite productively. And can I just say, I really don't want there to be a nuclear war, because I want to have, like, 11 babies. I want like a football team of babies. Can I just say it's not just the technologies as well, it's, it's the literal kit. Yeah, yeah, right? that's what I meant. Not yeah, just yeah. like metaphorical technology, yeah, I'm talking yeah, about like yeah. tech tech. Yeah, yeah, like the, the actual kit that's used in these theatres of war is, uh, you know, at reduced cost then given to various, yeah. you know, um, police forces. I think one, one example is Steven Seagal in his American <laughs> series Lawman. Uh, there's a video of Steven Seagal with who is this guy that was uh, let off by Trump recently? Joe yeah, uh, Arpaio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that, I can't remember. There's, if you go on YouTube, Arpaio Segal, he's like, what's going on in the Arizona? And it's like, Arpaio's from like the north, right? Arizona's like a borderland with Mexicans, as you're saying. And it's purely for the cameras. They, they basically like drive a tank through like a chicken farm. Mm. And he's like, they were cockfighting, like they were breeding chickens for cockfighting. It's like, this is 
unreal. And it wouldn't happen to a white American. Oh, it could, but it's highly unlikely. And, and this was a perfect example, albeit a very funny one, not for the gentleman involved, of course, but. And yeah, I think it's a way of rendering these demands tangible. Because I think that, and we saw this with the nature of the anti-war movement in 2003, is that these things had a limited amount of mass participation, but it felt so distant, that cognitive dis distance with the war on terror. Few people cried, most people were silent. In terms of saying, well, the threat's here, there's a fifth column of Muslims. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they were operating on a different kind of terrain. Um, and I think that there's a way to bring that back and not see that ground to the right. We, can we get, because I just saw Lawman come up. Can we cut to Lawman with the sound? Wouldn't that be amazing? Steven Seagal <laughs> was, I was listening to Chapo Trap House and they were saying how, oh, is this it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we get the sound on? Oh my God. Is this, is the sound on? There he is, the culprit. <laughs> <laughs> the fifth column. There's Seagal, look, with Joe Arpaio. <laughs> and they, they bust up like a chicken farm. And they kill a puppy, I think. <laughs> Just and, to make it. <laughs> and this is like regular law enforcement in the US, and they've got like snipers, and like, it's, cr it's yeah, unbelievable. But then, you, but then you look at the presence of the National Guard in Ferguson, and you, you, know, mm. you look at how they're kitted out. I mean, these aren't, you know, we're not just talking about kind of metaphorical resonances here. Yeah. It's like, um, it's something that's really immediate. I, I had really good friends who were on the, the big, uh, the Native American protest, the pipeline. Um, uh, the d no D A P L. No D A P L. They, they were out there. Some of them were, some of them were um, First Nations people, but loads of vet loads of veterans went there, obviously, and they found themselves on a kind of picket line, faced with all the kit that they used in Afghanistan. Wow. Like looking at it, these were guys in the, in uh, the v VFP America, but it was just. They were stunned by the fact that all the bomb-proof vehicles that they were given and the rifles and the sniper rifles and the drones and the sound weapons and the stuff they would have used yeah. uh, on operations was suddenly pointed at them. This was the, you know, they, went, they switched sides and, and found themselves staring down the barrel. Bloody hell. I remember those, we, we should cut this in a sec, but uh, there's a book by a guy called Frank Kitson. Mm. Who was, a, I think, a brigadier a monstrous in creature. Burma? Yeah, he, and he masterminded the Northern Ireland. Exactly, and yeah. the, this is the book that basically encapsulates some of the logic behind that. It's called Low Intensity Operate or Countering Low Intensity Insurgency, yeah. and the book is just unreal because he's it's written in the early 1970s, and he's saying, look, the things we've learned in Burma, the things we've learned repressing colonial conflicts, mm -hmm. we're now having to use in Northern Ireland, and we'll have to use them on the British mainland. He looks like that kind of guy. Yeah, well, and he, no, but he explicitly says, and we'll have to use them on the British mainland this decade, and of yeah. course with urban riots, mm. primarily centred around people of colour in uh, Toxteth and Brixton in the 80s, yeah. and we see that carrying on. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's prophetic in a way. Yeah, this, and this is what gets me, I mean, one of the big issues around the veterans community now is kind of legacy prosecutions for Iraq and Afghanistan, there was a lot of stuff about that, mm. and then Northern Ireland, and they, it was always the case that, even down to the Marine A case, where this mm. Marine executed a, and he, like, he went down and should have gone down, to me, mm. that's, that's my view. Um, but it's always, there's a phrase in the army, shit rolls downhill. It's never a Kitson. It's always Lance Corporal Scumbag or Sergeant Scumbag. It's never the guys at the top. It's never at the level of senior command or the, the executive level. It's never Tony Blair. It's always Private Jones. Uh, and, and Kitson is a classic example of that. He's still, he's still kicking. I think he's in his 90s now. Yeah, yeah. He's the architect of this brutal, brutal campaign in Northern Ireland based on these other brutal campaigns yeah. he'd conducted in Burma and Malaya and and then Kenya, who's involved in the Kenya, I think. Um, but th those guys just keep on kicking but like it, in, and it all rolls downhill to these, uh, Brit, to these guys. Brits don't know about this, but like in Malaya, uh, maybe, it, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, in Malaya they literally forced people, like half a million people were moved into purpose-built yeah. cities. They, which they called concentration camps. Yeah, they so called, they could monitor them. Yeah. And it's like, they, they like half a million people. Do yeah. not get me started wow. on the failure wow. of Britain to uh, reckon with its colonial past because we've got, yeah. I mean, yeah. we but can have a whole like, hour long This isn't like the 19th that. century, right? No. Like you say, the guy's still it's alive. It's a living memory. The guy's literally memory. still alive. I, a good friend of mine, Walter, was there. He was a 17-year-old Cold Street guardsman, taking, burning these people's food, taking them off the land. He's in his 80s now, amazing guy, lives in London. We should um, get him on. No, he's fantastic, absolutely fantastic, Walter. And he, uh, no, he was there, he was involved in all this stuff and he was, um, he breaks down like 40, 50 years on or whatever it is. Now, um, and he took you know they were, they were they had bounties for heads, they they had um, there are the tribesmen, of Dayak, like, yeah. tribesmen, yeah, yeah, and they had there's a, there's a shocking image of a, of a Royal Marine with a head, and they would take bounties, and they would, the guys were encouraged to take the heads of the communist insurgents. Oh, of course, it was all naturally about Dunlop mm. rubber, 
um, and they would get a bounty from like the local council. Take your head down, the local council and will pay you however much in the local currency. Savage. Well, we have to get Joey back on. Yeah. Don't we? I'm around. And this has been like the best discussion on easy. like leftist international relations and geopolitics that I've had in a really long time. Thank you. <laughs> and your book is, what's it called again? Soldier Box. Buy it. It's awesome. It's with Verso books. Who am I looking at? Which camera? <laughs> <laughs> Buy it. We'll, we'll, get Joey, we'll get Joey back on and then the legend Harry Leslie Smith wants to come. Soldier thing. Do you know something? I think like Buy it. I think it's because I never knew my granddad. I feel this intense sense of affinity with Harry Leslie Smith. I just kind of want him to give me no, some like life he's, advice. He's, and I think he's built that space that Tony Benn used to occupy when Tony Benn passed away. He's like the old wise lefty dude. Yeah. For me, that's how I look at Harry Leslie Smith. Mate. Me and my, it's like me the and Gandalf my, figure. Me and my friend call him um, Teflon White Man because it's like because <laughs> it's like <laughs> the reason I call him Teflon White Man is because he's like, listen, I fought in World War Two. It's like ah, so you're down with like you know expansionist imperialism. He's like, no. Yeah. Um, it's great. It's Thanks. just like he's like kind of love he's, that guy. It's perfect. Love that guy. We love you, Harry. He is a treasure. Yeah, we'll get Harry Leslie Smith on. There you go. Absolute don. Absolute. Boy. My grandfather, Abs Harry Leslie Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see the resemblance. Um, <laughs> no, he's a don. He's a, he's an absolute dynamo. We'll get him back on. Joey, what a gem. Cheers, mate. What Thanks a treasure. Thank you. Thank you, mate.